My name is Mark Rosenthal. I'm a, a curator living in New York City, and I recently did an exhibition devoted to William Kentridge. And the exhibition is currently being, it was first shown in San Francisco, at the San Francisco MoMA. Uh, then it went to the Fort Worth uh, Modern Art Museum. It's currently at the Norton just up the road in uh, West Palm Beach, and it's there until January 18th. And it uh, looks fabulous at the Norton, I want to emphasize, so that anybody who could see it there really ought to try to see it there. After the Norton, it goes to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, opening at the end of February, and then it begins a very long tour going all over Europe, Israel, and so forth. As I'm sure this group knows, the center of Kendridge's work, really, the main focus are the films, the films in his opera settings. And so what I can show is not the films. I can only show drawings or indications of what his work is like, but I think many of you know what his work is like. So what I'm going to talk about today briefly is the structure of the film, uh, the, the exhibition, and also the nature of his changing work. William Kentridge is a South African who was born in 1955 and really came to international prominence in the mid to late 90s. And I think part of the reason he came to such prominence has to do with the overall globalization effect of the world. And, uh, the, the attention he received as an artist was similar to the attention being given, especially in America, toward other phenomena outside America. Um, as we in America started to realize there was a world beyond our shores, and then came an understanding that certain artists working in very complicated places like South Africa had a great deal to tell us not only about their own homeland, but about the world in general, and about political art, which is very much central to Kentridge's work. So in the exhibition, uh, the exhibition is built around five themes, because Kentridge is very much preoccupied by a theme, one at a time, sometimes overlapping, and the first theme in, his, uh, in this exhibition is one of the themes for which he received so much attention, and it's called Soho and Felix. And Soho and Felix are the subject of nine films, and here are images of Soho and Felix on the screen, and Kentridge makes these films, he, he playfully calls them Stone Age, animation. They're made in a very simple way. And the characters you see there are Soho on the left, the rapacious businessman, and Felix, the sensitive poet. And a very strange thing happens as the films go on, uh, or not so strange. Actually, Felix falls away after the first few films, and Soho becomes the focus because Soho goes through a kind of emotional transformation, his wife falls in love with Felix. And this is an upsetting thing, needless to say, with a poet, no less. And the poet is always naked and naked to the world and so forth. And uh, Soho is always dressed in that pinstripe suit, no matter what the occasion. So these are two images from the first film in that series, which has that wonderful title you see, uh, Johannesburg's Second Greatest City After Paris. And it's not simply a playful title. I think it has all kinds of ramifications to do with the, the melting pot of Johannesburg. And as the film and as the films evolve, uh, one of the things that happens is that, and these are stills from one of the films. This is called Mine. The film is called Mine. And uh, the pictures you're seeing were taken from the catalog. And Kentridge actually participated a great deal in the catalog and the construction of the catalog. And he 
chose the uh, stills for to represent each film. At any rate, here is uh, Soho at his desk. Soho with one of his toys on his desk, which is a rhinoceros. And as Kentridge's career has evolved, the rhinoceros obviously symbolizes all of South Africa. And there is uh, Soho again. Um, I happen to be a person who loves to think about iconography and meaning, and Kentridge is, gives me lots to think about. And one of the things he loves to play with is the idea of a rock. And the rock is a burden, is South Africa, is all kinds of things. And there's Soho resting on his rock. Illness pervades uh, these films, and Soho becomes quite ill throughout the films. Um, and here you see, toward the end of the series, again, Soho and Felix juxtaposed. Um, one of the amazing things, I think, about Kentridge and why his work has had such an impact is that it's political, but it's political in a certain way. We come to think, I think, or we're handed an idea of political art as being uh, just a straightforward rendering of suffering. Uh, one thinks of Guernica, or one thinks of uh, Kate Kollwitz, mothers and children, and so forth. And certainly, that is the history of political art. Goya's Third of May, uh, where a criminal or a figure is being murdered. But Kentridge's form of political art takes on a very subtle kind of quality. Uh, Kentridge doesn't generally, it happens, depict violence. It does come up. It definitely comes up. But his work is very much about himself being a person living in South Africa, a white Jew living in South Africa. And his work is often very much about looking at himself, looking at what's going on. And one of the things that one starts to see in this theme is how similar Soho and Felix look, notwithstanding that one is clothed and one isn't. And what's more, if you meet William Kentridge, you discover that both these guys look like William Kentridge. So it's as if to say Kentridge carries good and evil within himself, and it's certainly a, a kind of aspect of his career. And incidentally, it's uh, fascinating to think about Kentridge in relation to Anselm Kiefer, who deals with some of the same themes. The second theme in the exhibition, the exhibition is constructed as follows. Each theme has films and then has drawings associated with the films. The drawings, um, and sometimes prints, and sometimes sculptures, to show how Kentridge becomes uh, so involved with one theme at a time and works it through in all these different media. So here I'm showing a couple of images from a film called Shadow Procession. The second theme is called Ubu and the Procession and has to do with the play by Alfred Jarry called Ubu. And um, Ubu, of course, was this horrible demonic character in the play. It was a play that was uh, very popular at the turn of the century in Paris. Picasso illustrated Ubu, uh, Max Ernst did as well. So in the, in the film that he, uh, Kentridge does, um, one sees Ubu, this horrible, evil, uh, demonic character, occasionally with his wife, who's even worse. And typically, they are presiding, or they are sort of lording it over these processions of black people. And processions are a dominant theme in Kentridge's work, come up over and over again, but are very important in the theme of Ubu and the procession. And then Kentridge did a series of drawings and prints in which uh, there's Ubu, always this fat guy, usually with a spiral on his stomach. But he puts himself into the character of Ubu. He uh, relates himself. Um, 
And here are two more of these wonderful drawings. These are very large drawings. Kentridge is uh, someone who's, who had a theatrical training and in fact studied acting as well as having studied uh, printmaking and so forth. And so his abilities and talents are very widespread between film, printmaking, he's a fantastic printmaker, as well as a draftsman. And here you see some of the uh, stills from one of the films called Shadow Procession. Well, Kentridge was doing, and I should add that Ubu and the procession is a theme that uh, Kentridge developed out of the period in South Africa when there was the hearings called the Truth and Reconciliation hearings um, that were occurring after the end of apartheid. And uh, it was a tremendously convulsive period in South African history, almost as much as what was going on during apartheid because people were examining what had happened. Well, these hearings ended and of course apartheid had ended and Kentridge started looking around at what other subjects might concern him. And the next subject that really appeared in his career in a major way uh, became the age-old subject of the artist in the studio. He simply looked at himself making art. And he did this series of films uh, they're called Seven Fragments for George Melias. And the films are always shown along with two other films um, called Journey to the Moon and Day for Night. Journey to the Moon was the title of a film by George Melias. Melias was uh, one of the first great filmmakers, a French filmmaker. And in that film, uh, Melias shows all kinds of kind of pictorial tricks and so forth. And Kentridge in his films, and you're simply seeing two of the films and a couple of stills from the films at that. Um, Kentridge performs lots of funny, wonderful kinds of sleights of hand. It's often, these films are often kind of comic and funny. I think there's a resemblance to Charlie Chaplin at times. He sort of uh, stoops and crosses the screen in the same way tossing papers into the air and catching them at the same time. Well, this series of films and the drawings that went with them represented a gigantic breakthrough in Kentridge's career. I think a lot of people internationally knew Kentridge's work in the art world uh, as it had to do with South Africa, whether the Soho and Felix or the Ubu things. But this body of works uh, is somewhat known, but is new for many people. And that is part of the thrust of our exhibition, is to have the whole new aspect of Kentridge's career that's lesser known. And one of the things that happened in Kentridge's career is that the scale changed. With the Soho and Felix films and the Ubu films, in the beginning, they were always shown on uh, monitors in the way that videos often are, or on small screens. But with the Melias films, they took up large room, sort of like a room like this. And Kentridge's work started to take on an even greater theatricality, a powerful kind of theatricality in which the work uh, surrounds the viewer and has a whole different impact on the viewer. And this is one of the qualities that uh, distinguishes Kentridge's earlier work from his newer work, is all the scale, this fantastic scale that surrounds you. These are some of the drawings that go along with the theme of the artist in the studio. And he's, Kentridge is tremendously knowledgeable about art history. And so uh, things that look a little like Picasso undoubtedly were inspired by Picasso. Kentridge acknowledges that much. But the artist in the studio theme is, of course, uh, one that practically belongs to Picasso in the 20th century. Well, then, after having turned to the artist in the studio, Kentridge's next impetus came from a commission 
the uh, Opera House of Brussels approached uh, Kentridge to think about doing an opera, specifically the Magic Flute by Mozart. And uh, giving it some thought, he decided he would love to do it. And what it meant was he did everything associated with it. He did the costumes, he did the set designs, he did the set, uh, he did the uh, theatrical, uh, the instructions of how the actors moved and so forth. The lighting was fantastically important. Uh, everything having to do with uh, the Magic Flute production became what Kentridge was involved with. And in fact, he wound up uh, being obsessed by the Magic Flute, obsessed as it were, for almost four years. And he did a tremendous series of works associated with it, but starting with um, the production itself. But then the spin-off works began with this piece. What you're looking at, of course, is a blackboard on which appears a film called Learning the Flute. And Learning the Flute has to do with Kentridge learning the flute, learning about the magic flute, learning about the motifs of the magic flute and how he would start to explore them. So it was, again, him looking at himself, looking at the subject matter. Well, he, the magic flute then was done in Brussels and proceeded to circulate around the world to all kinds of places, Naples, New York. It's been shown in many locations, this production. But while working on it, he wound up making some objects. Well, he made lots of drawings. But on the left, you see a kind of theater, a kind of miniature theater. In fact, it's eight feet tall, about six feet deep, six feet wide. So it's a large object. It's in the exhibition. And it, in fact, is what he was working with to plan the lighting effects. The lighting effects are fantastically important to what you see when you see the magic flute. And you get a bit of an idea of what an Im a single scene looks like in the image on the right. And this became an independent work of art, uh, this flute, this, this object, this uh, box. And it became known as preparing the flute. Well, in the typical way that Kentridge thinks about things and turns ideas over and over in his mind, uh, there were two sequels to The Magic Flute, one of which I'm showing here. Um, he thought a lot about the theme of The Magic Flute, and he thought a lot about uh, the period known as the Enlightenment, German Enlightenment, and the way that Mozart apparently epitomized this fantastic period in the history of Germany. And what a wonderful time it ostensibly was. Um, but Kentridge, of course, is aware of what subsequently happened in Germany. But before that, he introduces us in the work you see here called Black Box to an episode I certainly didn't know about. Um, there was once a country in Al Africa called Southwest Africa. There was once a nation. Forgive me if all of you know this, but some of you I'm sure don't. There was once a country called Southwest Africa. It's now called Namibia. And Southwest Africa was colonized by the Germans. They took it over. And unbelievably, the Southwest, Southwest Africans decided to rise up and rebel against the Germans. Whereupon, um, and these, this information is very little known outside Africa, but it's, there's now been a book about it in Germany. The Germans uh, killed 75% of the population of Southwest Africa. This was in the beginning of the 20th century. So Kentridge uh, is very interested in this aspect of German history as he's interested in the Enlightenment. So the first of the two sequels to The Magic Flute became a, a theater piece, which you see on the left. Well, you're, what you're looking at, again, uh, the black box work looks a little like the preparing the flute on the left. It's a big theater. And here you're looking at some of the images. And what happens in black box is that um, 
he creates a melange between Namibian music or the Herrera music, the music of South Africa, and Mozart's music. And there are, in this uh, object, there are puppets. There's all kinds of things that happen. It's a very, very elaborate work in which he sort of juxtaposes these two elements of South a of, uh, German history because, of course, he's interested in that. He's an incredibly well-read, thoughtful person who thinks about these kinds of things. And so he brings these two things together. Well, most recently, most recently, uh, Kentridge, about two and a half years ago, was asked by the Metropolitan Opera in New York to consider doing another opera. And making these kinds of decisions to do operas um, is difficult for him because he then is going to be consumed by this for several years. All his activity will be built around it. But he decided to do it. He loves it. He loves theater, and he, he loves digging in. And so uh, working with the Metropolitan Opera, he came up with the idea to do a production of an opera called The Nose by Shostakovich. And The Nose is based on a short story by the, the Russian writer Gogol. And it, it's a kind of absurd story about a, a, a uh, petty bureaucrat who wakes up one morning and discovers he has no nose on his face. And he becomes bewildered and confused and terribly worried. And he starts running around the city looking for his nose. And he finally finds his nose, but his nose has become another petty officer who's more important than him. And this causes great consternation for this poor man. And it then is the basis of the opera. Well, Kentridge is very interested in Russia in the period after uh, the Russian Revolution and what happened to artists in that period, including Shostakovich. So that production will open in New York at the Met at the same time as the exhibition arrives in New York at MoMA. So we wanted to include that theme in the show. Um, and what we have is a fantastic work of eight films that run at the same time. And here you're seeing a couple of them. Um, and these eight films together have a title called I Am Not Me, The Horse Is Not Mine. And it has to do with a Russian folk story about a guy getting arrested for having stolen a horse and uh, trying to deny his guilt and trying to deny his identity and so on and so forth. And these films all play at once, again, it's, again in a large room like this. So, and music plays a very powerful role in all these films, incredibly powerful. It's a loud, raucous, exciting production, and it sort of now carries us uh, way beyond where we started in Kentridge's career with Soho and Felix, with these large-scale works still dealing with history, but dealing with an analysis of history as told by uh, sort of one person looking at it himself. So I encourage you all to see the exhibition in Palm Beach at the Norton, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>